And I got a phone call by a buddy of mine who's a lawyer in Oxford. He said, hey, Isaac, I'm up here on the square, and I'm seeing nothing but your son, Zach Jenkins, blue lights, police, and they're sitting on the sidewalk, and you might want to get up here. And immediately I was confronted. I remember as I'm getting in my truck and I'm driving to the square and I just know, I just talked to Zach about drinking and driving and about the idea of getting an MIP, a minor in possession. We had just had this conversation a week before and all of a sudden these thoughts are flying through my mind of, okay, where is my identity? Is my identity in my children? Because I get compliments all the time about my kids. Hey, your kids are so beautiful and your kids are such great athletes and they're so liked at high school and they have so many friends and, and all those things are true about my, my kids. But I have to always be careful, am I placing my identity and my significance in my children and what people think about me, or am I keeping my identity in Christ? Okay? Well, I get to the square, sure enough, I get Zach in the car, and he was in the car. It was uh, three boys and a girl driving. Luckily, she hadn't had anything to drink, but they had alcohol in the car, so all three of the boys got minor in possessions. And Zach just cried like a baby uh, as he was in the car with me, and I realized at that moment I needed to be a dad of, of mercy and grace. Now, the dad of judgment would come later, but at that moment, I needed to show mercy and grace, and I did. But it reminded me, what, it, what am I placing my identity in? I want to read two phrases here that's on your, the paper that, that I gave you, the little handout. I, I, I was going to just share it with you, but I knew many of you would try to write it down, so I thought, I'll just type it out and read it for you. But look at this. Understanding your position in Christ will help you place your identity in the right place, which is in Christ. First of all, you've got to understand your position in Christ. The more you understand your position in Christ, which is what we're going to talk about this morning, that will help you place your identity in the right place. Because the world is always going to gr try to grab you and your love and your joy and your self-worth and everything and throw it towards other things. And those things are always going to let you down. I can tell by how much you worship and, and place your identity in other things by how, by how let down you are when they let you down because they will let you down a boyfriend's gonna let you down a spouse is gonna let you down your job what people think about you those things are gonna come and go but Christ will not if you never fully realize your position in Christ you will always run to other things to find your significance and place your identity in those things and you will not experience the abundant life period what I'm talking about, the abundant life that I'm talking about, I'm not talking about today this thing you may have heard of called the prosperity gospel, where if you give money to the church or you do good, God will bless you financially. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the joy that I have from uh, now. This last summer was 30 years ago I gave my life to Christ. And that joy has gotten deeper and more full over the years has, has, as I have experienced and understood my position in Christ. I'm going to take you to the Word, but before I do that, I'm going to share an example uh, for you, and that's going to be kind of my thread throughout the rest of my talk this morning, and that is a story about my sister. My sister has been a missionary in Honduras now for about 15 years, and about 10 years ago, she was told about this little boy. She works kind of in a, she and her husband, she met her husband there. He was from California, and I did their wedding uh, several years ago, and they've not been able to have children. And they run this kind of halfway house that's connected to the orphanage in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. And they'll have about 10 or 15 kids in high school that they kind of mentor and kind of get them ready to go in the real world. Well, Jennifer's heart was broken one day because she heard about this little kid named Rodolfo that um, lived on the streets. And he was about three or four when he was found by one of the orphanage uh, head guys. And Rodolfo's mom um, was not quite all there mentally. She would roam the streets. They lived in a little bitty hut. It was a one-room hut, uh, dirt floors, and a little ditch dug in the back of it so they could use the bathroom, and it would go out the back of the hut. And that was Rudolfo's world. He was literally, completely, uh, just utterly, just nothing. He had nothing but barely a mom. And um, um, so they, they brought Rudolfo into kind of one of those little orphanages, and then my sister allowed him to come live with her and Robert, and they began to kind of take care of him. And then I went to see my sister one summer, several summers ago, and while I was there, Jennifer, my sister, got the phone call that Rodolfo's mom had died. And in a third world country, it's pretty cheap to bury somebody. It's about $100 for a coffin is what I learned, and about $100 to pay the grave diggers. And what they do is they just go out on the side of a mountain, and they just dig a hole, and there's this kind of mass grave area. And uh, we put Rodolfo's mom in a coffin, 
Uh, and this is pretty normal in third world countries. Drove her in a truck, went out there. Uh, Rodolfo had a couple distant family members that met us out there. And we took shovels and we literally lowered uh, Rodolfo's mom on the ground and just shoveled the dirt. And I mean, we literally had just a little service for Rodolfo's mom. And then y'all, after that, Rodolfo had nothing. But my sister adopted Rodolfo and it took about two years through the process. And now Rodolfo is actually my, my uh, nephew and he's a part of our family. And I want to talk to you about the significance of Rodolfo because where Rodolfo was is where we, was, we were spiritually. Look at this passage. First of all, in Romans 3, I'm, not going to, I'm only going to read a few of these passages this morning, and then when I dismiss you, I want you to read through the rest. But it says in Romans chapter 3, None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. You all, I used to be guilty of giving my testimony and saying, yeah, I was just kind of a good kid, grew up in the South, and then one day I heard the gospel and I heard the message of Christ, and it just made sense, and I gave my life to Christ. And it was almost like I was sounding like I was some good kid that somehow deserved for God to reveal himself to me. And as I began to think back about that, I, I, I was convicted because I can remember I can remember cussing God and looking at the ceiling and cussing him because my dad had left my family and I had to grow up without a dad. One time my mom was brutally attacked when she went jogging and she was raped and almost killed when I was in eighth grade. And I wanted to kill that guy because of what he did to my mom. And I had total hate and rage for years. So I wasn't a good kid growing up in the South. I had serious anger and unforgiven issues in my life. And God was going to have to change that. Look at Romans chapter 5. So it says, for while we were still helpless, I highlighted the reality. I always like to know my reality. Tell me my reality and I can deal with that. Here's our reality. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You all, Christ didn't die for us because we were good. We deserved it. We were doing nice things. No, we were helpless, ungodly. We were sinners. And look at this. We were saved from the wrath of God through him. Do you realize we were going to receive God's wrath? Revelation says it is building up like in a pot, and it's stirring, and it's getting more and more and more ready. And God is going to pour his wrath on those who are helpless, ungodly, and sinful. It says, for if while we were yet enemies... Did you know at one time you were an enemy to God? And you go, I didn't know I was an enemy. I thought God was just kind of this guy out there, and eventually he was going to grade me on a curve, and maybe I'd make it. But no, enemies of God are not going to make it to be with God one day. But it says, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we, will, we shall be saved by his life. Flip on to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Once again, very sober to read this passage. It says, remember that you, Paul says to the church of Ephesus, remember that you at one time were separated from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. You all, we were separated, alienated, strangers, and we were hopeless without God. But now, but, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. You all, I want you to understand, we are unworthy, but we are not worthless. The name Satan and devil mean two different things. One is hater of the brethren, and the other is accuser of the elect. Satan hates you, and he's going to accuse you as long as you let him. It's one thing to know, okay, I know that I'm not perfect. I know I make a lot of mistakes. I am desperately wicked and sinful and hopeless apart from Christ. But don't think that you are worthless because you are worth something. Matter of fact, you are so infinitely worth something that Christ gave his life for you. And now the good news is, look what's happened. Okay, so imagine at one time we were like Rudolfo. We were, we were an orphan. We wandered the streets. We, we ate out of the trash cans. And if Rudolfo had not been saved by my sister... We went one day, you all, and we fed people at the city dump. Well, I was, the next time I went to Honduras, I took both my boys. And my sister connected us with some other guys that go out to the city dump and take a sugapa and feed the people there. And, y'all, it was the most terrible place I've ever been. I've done ministry in Haiti. I've done ministry in about 20, 20-plus 20 countries around Eastern Europe, 
all around the world, and the city dump in Tegucigalpa, uh, Honduras, is the worst place I've ever been because people are living out of the trash, and the trash was just as far as you could see, and these dump trucks are, are dropping trash, and people are trying to collect Coke bottles, uh, and, and they're, they're just, and most of them are high on, on glue, and it was just a depressing place. It was really sad, and that's potentially where Rodolfo would have ended up. And I want you to understand, you all, that is where you came from spiritually. But let's look at the good news of what Christ did for us. All right? Now and for eternity. Look at Colossians 1.13. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness. Physically, some of you may have given your life to Christ this past year. Some of you, I believe, during this, these two weeks, you're going to get it for the first time. You may have come here because you thought it was a good thing to do. You wanted to get to know God better, but it's going to click. And maybe it clicks for you today, and you realize, man, I, I, yeah, I'm 18, 19 years old physically, but spiritually, it seems like I was dead. And spiritually and physically speaking, spiritually, it says we were living in the domain of darkness. But look what God did to us through Christ. When we say yes to Christ and know to ourselves, he transfers us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption. We have been redeemed. We have been bought at a price. And the price was his son. And our sins have been forgiven. Look at 2 Corinthians 6, 18. I will be a father to you and you will be sons and daughters to me. Do you realize as a Christian, I'm not just a Christian now. I am God's son. He loves me. He cherishes me. And when I was driving down here uh, last week, I was listening to a Christian radio station, and they were talking about a study that was done amongst a large group of Christians, liberal and conservative, and 38% of Christians, according to this survey, believe that, number one, God is angry at me, and soon he's going to give me judgment. Okay, these are people that call themselves Christians. So if that's true, then almost 40% of you all in this room believe God is angry at you, and he some, one day soon is going to swiftly bring judgment on you. And I want you to understand that is not true. God loves you. You are his child, and he only has great things for you. Now, in Hebrews it says God disciplines everyone he loves, and he chastens every child that is his. In other words, I love my kids so much, I will kick their butt, okay? Zach lost his iPhone for a month, and he spent the next four weekends home with us because of that MIP. But that's because I love Zach so much. I want him to make wise choices. And God loves you. And what he has for you is great. Look at this next passage. He has not dealt with us, Psalm 103, 10 through 12, according to our sins. Nor has he rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. And then one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, as far as the east is from the west... So far as he removed our transgressions from us. Some of you think that if you stood before God right now, you would be so embarrassed to see God's face. You would be so ashamed because of things that you have done. But you know what I believe is that God would look at you and say, come on in. I don't, and if you bring those things up to God, I believe he'll say, I don't even know what you're talking about. Because when God forgives, he forgets. There was a guy named Louis Samperini. They're making a movie. It's going to come out here soon. I read the book about him about eight or nine years ago called The Devil at My Heels. But the, the story of Louis Samperini is so amazing that they've redone the story and wrote the book. Some of you may have heard of it uh, called Unbroken. And now they're making a movie that's going to come out this next year. And Louis Samperini was a, uh, he was a Olympic runner turned uh, fighter pilot in World War II. He was shot down over the ocean. And he and two other guys survived on a raft. One of the guys would end up uh, dying, but two, these two guys would survive 40 days on a raft, only to be eventually captured by the Japanese and tortured for the next four years in a Japanese camp. And he tells these just terrible, horrendous stories that the Japanese would do to them. But fast forward, sorry I'm ruining it for you, go see the movie anyway because it'll be good, but, but Lewis ends up being taken to a Billy Graham crusade because he survives the war, comes back to America. His wife talks him into going to this Billy Graham crusade. He doesn't know who Billy Graham is, but he has these terrible nightmares of hate and vengeance that he wants to have to the commandant of the Japanese camp that he was at. Well, he comes to know Christ, starts traveling around the nation, sharing his story with Billy Graham, and one day he feels God calling him to go back to Japan to share Christ with those men who were so mean to him. So he raises money, raises support, flies back to Japan, goes to the main prison where they've, they've uh, captured all these 
Japanese prisoners of war, and they have them in this place, and he makes them all come together, and he shares the gospel. He shares his message of forgiveness and how God had forgiven him, and he said, if any of you Japanese uh, soldiers want to give your life to Christ, raise your hand right now, and tons of them raised their hands. And he said, you know what? If you were in that camp that I was at, I just want you to know I totally have forgiven you. And come down afterwards. I'd like to see you. And some of these men came down, these, these uh, wardens of the, of the camp and these, these commanders of the camps came down, and he got to hug them and talk to them. And then he asked them, hey, what happened to the overall main commander? Because this main commander used to really be mean uh, to Lewis and tell him he was going to kill him, they were going to torture him, all these things. And, and they were like, well, actually, he got away. Um, he never got captured, and he lives um, away from here somewhere. And then Lewis says this, and to me it's the, it's the most powerful part of the entire book and the entire story of his life. Lewis says, you know, if I was to somehow be able to meet that guy and talk with him today, you know what I would do? I wouldn't even bring up the war. I wouldn't even talk about what happened in that camp. I'd ask him about his family. Did he get married? Did he have kids? Because when God forgives, he forgets. Isn't that powerful to think about that? Louis Samperini, of all people, has every reason to want to kill that guy, but he, he forgave that guy so completely that he said, when God forgives, he forgets. And I want you to understand that when God sees you, he sees you as forgiven. He loves you, and his love for you is complete. And the more you will understand your position in him, that you are loved, that you are cared for, that all, everything he has for you in the future is going to be amazing. The more you understand that, the more you will have peace and the more you'll want to place your identity in him and not other things because other things are going to let you down I think we got a picture of Rodolfo we went water skiing and I'll show you this so we go water skiing every summer with some of my cousins up in Indiana and this particular lake right here um, that's Zach my oldest trying to be cool on the tube but uh, Every, okay, every one of the lots on this lake are supposed, this is supposed to be the most expensive lakefront property in the nation. It's over a million dollars just for a little plot on the front of this lake. And my cousins are very, very wealthy. My aunt and uncle are multimillionaires. And we get to go up to Indiana every year and we all hang out. But it was just so um, amazing to me to think about as Rodolfo was out on this tube, he came and joined us uh, a couple summers ago and got to go tubing with my, my uh, kids. And to think about where Rodolfo was hopeless, without hope, living on the streets, having no family uh, left, to now he's adopted by my sister. Uh, he's, he's a part of royalty spiritually, but physically he gets to come and do these amazing things he would never have gotten to do. And you guys, what I call that is progressive revelation of God's goodness. Progressive revelation of God's goodness. As you will submit yourself to God and you will walk with him, he will only continue to give you deeper joy and he will use you in other people's lives I've got to see some amazing things happen in other guys lives and I'll talk about that next Monday but I want to close with this and help you understand and then I'll pray for you I'm gonna send you out but a, a perfect example is um, I was an elder at my church that I helped plant and I would teach at my church occasionally and one day I got a phone call by one of the Ole Miss uh, football coaches. He was the strength coach. I had met him a few times. His name was Don Decker. And he asked me to come over to his office. And I was like, yeah, sure, man, what's up? And he goes, hey, Isaac, um, we've got a chaplain with the football team, but I really want to have another chaplain. And I've been talking with Coach Nutt, and I want you to be that guy. And I was like, well, bro, um, yeah, I mean, I could maybe do that. I mean, I had no idea what I was saying yes to. I thought maybe it was on a Saturday coming over and giving the guys a little talk. I had no idea what I was agreeing to. And he was like, do you understand what that means? That means you're going to travel with the team. You're going to eat with the team. You're going to be a big part of the team. And I, I remember going, Don, I don't even have an Ole Miss piece of clothing. I'm an Arkansas fan, okay? I work here at Ole Miss. All, everything I have is Arkansas. So he takes me across the indoor football practice facility, takes me into this room that's like a... It's like a library of Ole Miss clothes. And these guys begin to just lay clothes as, I mean, just pile clothes on me. The coaches' outfits, the co coaches' jackets, the shirts, the shorts, all this stuff. And I didn't know it, but for the next two and a half years, I would go on a, a really fun ride where Don Decker would almost become a brother to me. I mean, he's become one of my closest friends. We just really connected. And, and uh, two of the, the, the most exciting things that happened during that time is one time, the uh, offensive coordinator, Coach Lee, called me one morning. He said, 
hey, Isaac, um, Peyton and Eli are in town, and we're just going to be throwing the football around. Just want to see if your boys want to come out and hang out. And I was like, sure, I'm in. So I took my boys, and uh, I got to throw the football. I think we got a picture of them uh, when they're hanging out. And of course, Peyton didn't know how close he and I were going to get later. But um, the, there he goes. Yeah, this is the boys at the indoor uh, football facility. But, but then Decker calls me into his office one day, and he goes, hey, Isaac, listen, um, so you've done six of the chapels this year, and you were 6-0 and oh in wins. So Coach Nutt wants you to go to the Cotton Bowl and do the Cotton Bowl Chapel. And I was like, well, Decker, I can't because I'm speaking the night before at a Christmas conference in Atlanta with crew. And he said, no problem. We'll just fly you in early that next morning. I'll have a chauffeur pick you up. We'll take you straight to the deal, have you speak to the team. You'll be on the sidelines during the game. And then the, we're going to stay with uh, uh, Coach Nutt and Danny Nutt that night. And the next day, we're going to go to the Cowboys game, Dallas Cowboys back at the stadium. And I'll get you a ticket. Uh, you won't be able to sit with Jerry Jones and us in his box. But right afterwards, I'll bring you in. You can hang out with us. What do you, what do you think? And I'm like, dude, I'm in. Okay, sign me up. <laughs> but you know, that's, that was one of those deals that that day I was called by Don Decker into his office. I had no idea what I was getting into. And you all, I believe you were not looking for God. You were lost. You were blind. You were on your own going the opposite direct direction. I believe God reached out in his love and his mercy and he grabbed you and he brought you in. All right? And, and the things that he wants to give you, the joy uh, that, that, you, that comes from following him, the peace patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, the fruits of the Spirit. He wants to give them to you in amazing depth, but you've got to be willing to place your identity in Him. You've got to make Him your Lord. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray right now as we break and we go spend some time alone with you, Lord, I pray that for many of us, maybe this would be the beginning of understanding our position with you. Lord, I'm sorry that at times in my life I can remember thinking that you were angry with me or maybe you did not love me or you did not have my best interest in mind. And Lord, I have this just natural desire to go to other things or to other people or the significance of my job or my position. And all those things, Lord, are meaningless compared to you. Lord, although you may bless me at times and you may give me certain things, Lord, I want to hold them loosely I want to lay them out of my hands and know that you may take them at any time because my position is secure with you, 100% secure, and my identity, is, I want it to be totally in you. Father, I pray as, as these students read through these passages right now, Lord, as they maybe soak in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 10, they would realize that it is 100% you, Jesus, and 0% us, which equals salvation. But the result is good works. Lord, I thank you that I didn't have to do any good to get into heaven. There was nothing about me that made me attractive. I was lost, dead. I deserved your wrath. But Father, you loved me, you cared for me, and you, you call me your child now. And Lord, now I know I'm part of royalty. And I praise you and I thank you. I give you all the glory and the honor that you deserve. And Jesus, I thank you, according to Revelation 5 one day, that when we see you in heaven, we're going to see you like the disciples saw you after you were resurrected. We're going to know you by your wounds. We're going to see your wounds, and we're going to be reminded for eternity that the reason we're in heaven one day is not because of us. We'll be reminded every day that it's because of you and your wounds. And for that, we praise you, and we thank you in your name. Amen. What time, Bill, do we want to come back in? 1045, if you guys could just kind of go out in kind of a, a discipline of silence, get before the Lord, read through these passages, pray and ask the Lord to give you wisdom with this. And if you come back at 1045, we'll see you then.